Hey everybody, and welcome to episode 11 of Stitching Between Pages. Um, I'm Robin, and you can find me on Ravelry as half past 92, and on Twitter and Instagram as Medievalisting. Um, so thank you for joining me today um, to sit down and talk about knitting and uh, spinning now, and books and museums and all sorts of other fun stuff. Um, I'm very hopeful that when you see this, it will be Sunday, August 23rd. Uh, it is not currently Sunday, August 23rd, and things are very topsy-turvy, as you might recognize. I had to move my little plant stand because I needed something behind me. This is the same place um, where I filmed, I think it was last episode, with the postcards behind me. Uh, you will notice that the postcards are gone. And it took me a very long time <laughs> to come up with a solution for podcasting somewhere where you couldn't see boxes because I'm moving. Um, so I guess I will, I will get my exciting announcement out of the way um, right at the beginning. Um, this is something I've known about for a while, but have not, and it's not, it's not yarn or fiber related. Um, but I've not, I've not, I've not shared it um, prior to now. So I'm moving because I've been accepted to a PhD program in medieval history, and I'm so, I'm so thrilled, you guys. Um, this is it's a it's a dream come true for me to to be able to start this program, and to hopefully, if all goes according to plan, spend the rest of my life studying medieval women and teaching students. And so I'm really excited. This is like the first step towards that towards that goal. So um, today is Thursday, and it's the middle of the day, and I'm at home because I left my job, which I loved, um, but the PhD program was just, it was, ugh. Um, so here we are. I'm packing, and this weekend I am moving. Um, moving to Chicago. So it might take me a little while to, to get into a, I'm hopeful that I'll be able to keep up with my podcasting. Um, throughout the program. We'll see how it goes, um, and certainly that will always come first, but I love doing this, and I love sitting down and chatting with you guys about what's going on in my knitting, and my my book section might drop off dramatically because I suspect that most of my reading for the next five or six years will be history, and I don't think that's everybody's cup of tea, and I don't think I'm going to have too much time to read novels. So we'll see how it goes. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to try really hard to keep up at least some sort of podcasting. We'll see how it goes. But for now, I'm keeping up with my, my every other week. So like I said, when I upload this, hopefully if all goes according to plan, it will be Sunday, August 23rd. And this will be the last episode from the Washington, D.C. area and from my adorable little apartment here. So I'm hoping that soon I will have an adorable little Chicago apartment and can podcast from there. Um, but yes, that's that's my exciting news, and yes. Without further ado, though, let's get into the real reason we're here, which is knitting. And I always forget to say this. Thank you to everybody who's coming back, who's watched before and is watching again, and thanks to all the new viewers who are, who are checking me out. Um, I'm so glad you are, and I hope you, you know, like what you see and, and think about coming back. Um, I love doing this, so hopefully hopefully you also enjoy spending a little bit of time with me. Um, also, before I get any further, I wanted to thank um, Sue and Lynn of the Two Tangled Skeins podcast. I totally forgot to do this when I last podcasted, which um, I've been feeling bad for a week and a half because I, I forgot to mention that... Um, they gave my humble little podcast a shout out on their hugely comprehensive list of um, knitting podcasts, and I'm in really great company, and that was really, really quite an honor to be mentioned along with um, podcasts that I really look up to and that sort of started me on my own podcasting journey. So thank you, Sue and Lynn, and Two Tangled Gains is a great podcast, so if you have not checked it out, I highly encourage you to do so. So, without further ado, really this time, let's talk about knitting. And I actually, amazingly enough, have two and a half finished objects. 
Um, I don't have a whole lot in progress, and I don't think I don't think I have anything new in progress. But I did finish several things. So I wanted to get them off my needles, and I wanted to get them blocked before I packed up my blocking supplies. And you know, they sort of got they're packed in boxes that are not things I'm going to immediately unpack when I move. So I want to, you know, they're not they're not immediately accessible. So I've been, I prepared all of my um, knitting for probably the next couple of weeks, really. As a lot of my stash, that was one of the first things I've been packing for about a week now. And a lot of my stash, that was like the first thing that I packed because it's, much as I love it, it's not something that I need. And so I could pack it and like, I need my kitchen dishes or I need, you know, some clothes for the next few weeks. Um, Stuff like that I didn't want to pack, so I packed up things like stash and books and um, things that I think are necessary but that are not actually necessary. So all of my knitting for the next few weeks is in this really great bag. But first, coffee. With them. They're, they're really gold. They're shiny. I don't know if, if that's coming across, but I love this bag. And it's really great because it's a canvas tote bag, but it's three-dimensional. Um, there's... This is, this is the side, um, and it has a nice little gusset down here. Um, so most of my knitting for the next few weeks is, is packed in, in my tote bag, and um, I know I say that I'm not a project bag user, but look at all of these project bags. Whoa! So many project bags. This one is getting in the way. So many project bags. Um, and this handy dandy little thing, I had to go to Staples to get something else, and I found this, it's a zippered plastic wallet, um, or envelope as they call it, but it's clearly not an envelope because there's no flap. Um, and it's holding all of my patterns, so that's super exciting. And I just hit myself in the face with it. So, finished objects. Goodness, I feel I feel so scattered and I feel like everything is kind of scattered right now. I am a comparatively tidy person. I like things to be in their places and I have a certain threshold that I will allow things to become untidy and then once it hits that threshold, I clean everything. Um, and my apartment is currently way past my, my tidiness threshold. Um, this wall is nice and pleasant because um, I moved my little plant stand. The wall I'm facing is boxes. Like, it's, this is all of my packed boxes over here. There's a bunch of unpacked boxes over here, um, or boxes that have not yet, been, that are empty. Um, and things are just kind of in an uproar. So, but I wanted, I wanted to podcast. So here we are, I'm taking a break from my packing. So let me show you my finished objects. Yay, it's two shawls. Um, and I will, I will spoil, the half finished object is a sock finished one out of, out of obviously a pair. So this one I finished first and I love it. This is my, and as you can see, I did put tassels on all three corners. Um, and this is the Red Robin shawl. It's a curious handmade um, Helen Stewart design knit from the Wool Barns Luxury Sock Yarn in the Bunting colorway. Um, I've said all of this plenty of times. Um, I think I showed this off not last podcast, but the podcast before that, so episode nine, and said that I was thinking about knitting a few more rows of the texture section, and I did not. Um, I knit as many rows of texture as the pattern called for and as many rows of garter as the pattern called for. And um, the only thing that I expanded, and it was totally accidental, was the stock net stitch, stock and net stitch section, which is good because I used every single scrap of yarn. Um, I crocheted a square for my blanket and then I made the pom-poms or tassels. They're not pom-poms. I made the tassels out of what was left. And I don't know if you can tell, but the this is the tassel that's on the point of the shawl. And then there's two tassels on the corners. And the corner tassels are smaller <laughs> because I made a nice big tassel for the for the bottom point and then pretty much divided the rest of the yarn in half to make the two tassels for the points. Uh, so I am so pleased with how this turned out and it's really soft. 
um, and I'm really excited to wear it. So I just love, I just love the tassels. They're so much fun. Um, I debated for a while how long to make the strings holding them to the, you know, whether to put them really close or to let them sort of hang. And I'm letting them hang for now because I figured it would be easier to sort of pull this up and put the tassels closer to the points than it would be to go the other way. So obviously I have not worn it very much because it's, or at all, because it is August in the District of Columbia area. And we've had a few pleasant days, but it's been mostly very hot lately. So maybe I'll leave it on. I've been home all day, so my air conditioning has been going. Um, and it's it's cloudy outside. It, it, it's supposed to rain. It's also, it was supposed to rain Today's Thursday. It was supposed to rain Tuesday and Wednesday. No rain Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, but it really does look like it could rain today. So I'm hopeful that it does and cools it off just a little bit because tomorrow is the loading up of the U-Haul and moving. So that's pretty crazy. My other finished object, and I'm also so pleased with this, is my Raina shawl. Yay! And they're, they're very similarly sized. They're both small, single skein shawls. Um, this is knit out of Miss Babs Yummy 2 ply in the coffee break colorway, which is beautiful blues and golden browns, and there's like hints of hints of gray, which makes me think of cream in coffee. Um, so yes, I am I'm so pleased, and I love how the uh, sort of latticey eyelet sections get bigger the further down the shawl you go. Um, they get wider. So I really, I really love that. And I love how it's broken up by garter, garter stitch. Uh, I knit this exactly as the pattern specified. I have the exact number of rows for each section that, that the pattern calls for. And it was a bit of a game of yarn chicken uh, towards the end. I was not sure. I debated cutting out um, the last two rows or the last four rows of this um, latticey section. And I did not, and I'm glad I didn't because I made it, and I made it with enough yarn to crochet a square for my blanket. So there's, after crocheting the square for the blanket, there's maybe two yards of yarn left, but that's okay. Totally fine with that because I don't need any more. Um, so yes, very, very pleased with this. Um, and that is, that is that. So that's two new shawls. Um, Ooh, just banged my elbow on the, sorry about that. Uh, so there's my Reina shawl. Um, yeah, very, very happy with both of these. So my mug today, I don't think this, this little fellow has ever been on the podcast. I'm just drinking plain English breakfast tea because everything else is packed. Um, but this little guy was my, my mug at my office. And so he's come home with me now. Um, I got him, I think, when I was in New York City, um, just from like a Bed Bath & Beyond or something. But I thought he was he was super cute. And in packing, I've realized how ridiculously large my mug collection is. Um, one person does not actually need that many mugs, but I have that many mugs. So there we are, and I like all of them. So I've been I've been trying to sort of get rid of things or you know put things aside to think about donating or throwing away or giving to, to other people. And none of the mugs made it into that, that pile. So I, I, use, I use them all, I use them all. So let me show you my half finished. And this is probably not a surprise. But I have one finished blue tit sock. Yay! I love these. Um, and one of my friends who does not watch the podcast, I don't think, pretty sure, if she did, that would be odd. Um, she's not a knitter. So I tried. I tried to get her to become a knitter, and it, I was not successful. Um, she is she is crafty. She does other crafty things, but knitting is just not her thing, which is fine. Um, 
but she was over when I was working on these and she said that she loved the colors and, you know, kind of a subtle hint hint for Christmas. And I have knit things for her. Um, she's, she's definitely a knit worthy friend, but I'm curious, what are your thoughts on knitting socks for non-knitters? This wool is not super wash, so it would have to be hand washed. And I don't know. Does, has anybody knit socks for out of especially out of non superwash wool for people who are not knitters? Because after I finish a pair of socks, I have a substantial amount left over. I could do probably not another pair that's this tall, but I could do either a shorter cuff or I could do I love the little Rose City rollers pattern for the little um, ankle socks. Uh, and I really want to knit a pair of those. Um, I actually have um, some yarn that I'm thinking of using for a pair for either myself or for a Christmas present for somebody else. Um, but I would have enough to make a pair for her out of this yarn, which she loves. It's She likes, these are kind of her colors anyways. So what are your thoughts? Does anybody have any, any thoughts? Uh, but yes, so I have, I have one sock done. And I've not, I've not woven in the ends yet. Oh, well. Um, and I think I mentioned this last time, but once again, I just did a contrast color slip stitch, heel flap, heel, which has been my, my go-to heel for the past several pairs of socks. So I think after, after this pair, I might change it up and do something different, whether it's, um, I'm not sure if I'm, I, li I like, I love doing the contrast color heels and I think, um. I think they look really good, but I think I might take a break from contrast color heels for a little while. And I have begun the second sock. I did not make them, they, they almost match. Um, almost, not quite, but I'm okay with that. I decided that um, these stripes are small enough that it won't really matter. And I, I'll know, but I'm not going to be bothered by it. Um, and if I'm wearing them underneath pants or whatever, then nobody's going to see the cuff of the sock and evaluate, oh goodness, you did not make the match. So I am, um, I just started a couple nights ago, so haven't, haven't made it very far. Um, but there you go. I'm, I'm about through one repeat of the yarn. I'm back to the yellow. So I am knitting these on my Haya Haya Sharps DPNs. Um, US ones, which is a 2.25 millimeter. That's my, my go-to sock needle size. Um, I just have a plain, well, a pink. I love these um, sort of safety pin style stitch markers. I think they're really fun. And I got this one from, in my most recent order from the Wool Barn. Um, she always puts such lovely little extras in with her. Um, in with your purchase from her. So there we go. This is going to be great knitting for the drive um, this weekend. So that is that. And this is in my um, one of the project bags that I made with the bottom fabric is from um, Pearl Soho in New York City. Just a simple, simple drawstring bag. I'm embracing the project bags for the time being. So that is one work in progress. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to remember which thing I put in which project bag. I don't think I've showed off this bag on the podcast, and I, I made this one as well. It's just a simple little box bag. I did not make the crocheted cherries. Um, I think I've won them somewhere. Not from, where did I win these? I don't know, but they're kind of cute, and I think they make a good little zipper pull. Um, but I, I made this, it's just a, it's a very simple um, box bag with interfacing. And the inside is the same, the sort of very vibrant yellow-green chevron prints. Um, there you go. Uh, the seams on the inside are not, unfortunately, very finished. They're just raw seams. But that's okay, because it's just for me, and I don't mind. So in this bag, I have my Strand Hill cardigan, and I have not made a bunch of progress. I'm, st I'm still working on the yoke. Um, I've done 
I when I last showed this, I'd done I think three repeats of the lace or two repeats of the lace, and I've now done three. So I have one more to go before um, the yoke is finished, and I can take the sleeves off and then start the lace this lace pattern on the front panels of the cardigan. So there you go. Still loving it, but it does require a little bit more attention and focus, and that has not been. I've been packing and packing is making me frazzled. Although I'm very pleased with, there's something very satisfying about packing a bunch of odd shaped things really neatly into a box. Like kitchen things, when I have a really tidily packed box of kitchen things, makes me very happy. Um, and I've done a lot of sort of putting things in a box and then unpacking them a little bit and rearranging them so they fit better. Very strange. Um, but there you go. That's where that's where I am. Not a drastic difference from last time I showed this. Um, and again, it's the Strand Hill cardigan. I do not remember the designer's name, um, but it's available from Knit Picks, and I'm using Knit Picks Stroll um, fingering in the Dogwood Heather colorway. So I have three skeins, and I have one of them is this is the first one, this is the second one, and then I have a third one which is more packed away. Um, but I figured not to be too ambitious and just two skeins fit in my little box bag. So it's in the Dogwood Heather colorway, which is the colorway that um, the sample on the Knit Picks website was knit in, and I really like that sample, so I went with the same color. And I'm knitting it on Chowgu uh, Premium Stainless Steel circular needle US 8 which I believe is a five millimeter let's see here yep um, it's a 32 inch circular I think um, so there we go it's very I said this last time but it's still very strange to be knitting on comparatively pig needles it's been a long time since I knit something on um, anything bigger than a six really so there we go that's that and let's see here, the other two things I have packed are things that, um, to work on. In my You Must Not Ever Stop Being Whimsical bag, I have um, the yarn and needles to cast on my rainbow socks, so I might cast those on during the drive. Uh, now that I've started the second sock of my blue tit socks, uh, which is West Yorkshire Spinners four-ply yarn. I don't think I mentioned that. But I mentioned that every other time. And um, this bag, I'm not sure if this bag has ever appeared on the podcast. It is the same um, sort of basic drawstring bag as the one that you've seen several times and just saw with my blue tit socks in it. Uh, this is fabric. I got these fabrics both at a, um, it's, it's little tulips on the top. I don't know if you can see, you can tell better on the, on the And then just sort of a, I don't know, kind of looks like a vine to me, but I think it's just an abstract pattern. Um, I got these at a, a quilting shop, sort of nearish to my parents' house. Um, and then just little blue dots on the drawstring. But in here is the yarn. This is the second skein. And this is my campsite shawl, which I still have not, I've not done anything since I last showed this, but I've packed it, and since I have not very many knitting things packed to, accessibly packed to work on, um, I'm hoping that that will sort of, because I really love this project, but I just, it's not been something that I want to work on lately, partially because it's getting big, and it's DK weight yarn, and it's kind of hot outside, and I'm just not into that, so there we go my little progress marker from Danny of Little Bobbins with the little B on it. And um, so again, since it's been a while since I showed this, even though I have not done anything, the yarn is Loop Studio in the charcoal colorway. Um, it's a DK weight yarn with about 350 yards per 100 gram skein. Um, purchased from Loop in Philadelphia, and this is, so it's their, their shop's yarn. Um, and I have two skeins. Obviously, this is the second one, and I still have a little bit of the first one left to go. Um, I'm knitting this on my... Oh, haha, I lied. These are US 7s. Um, so it's a four and a half millimeter needle. And um, these are obviously Knitter's Pride 
carbon. Um, these, it's funny, these don't feel as big and awkward to me as the eights, but it's only a half a millimeter difference in their diameter. So I don't know what the story is with that. Um, but anyways, I have this packed away and ready to get some progress made on it. Um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm moving to Chicago, so I'm prime knitwear winters. Um, definitely, I'm looking forward to having a big cozy shawl to wear um, when it starts getting cooler and then cold. Chicago gets very cold. So I think that is all that I have in, yes, that is all that I have in my lovely coffee bag. Um, the other thing that I put a slight dent into this week, and for those of you who are on Instagram, you might have seen that, um, oh, who is it? Oh, I'm going to look on my phone and see if I can figure it out really quick. Um, there is a sock blanket madness tag. So last Friday, which was the 14th of August, you posted a picture of your sock blanket with your sock scrap blanket with the number of squares that you had completed. And then the idea is that you add as many squares as possible. And then this Friday, which is the 21st, you post a picture and say how many squares you added. I think it's, is it Wool Diaries? I think that might be, I will um, include it in the show notes. I'm pretty sure it's the Wool Diaries. Um, I'm certainly have not added, I haven't even added them. I've crocheted up a small number of squares. Um, I, I only have so many sock, sock scraps that have not already featured in my blanket. So um, I still have to add these little guys to my blanket. So I'm not, I'm not going to show you my, my whole blanket because it has not changed at all since I showed it a few weeks ago. Um, but I've, I've crocheted a few more squares. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that this will be my next packing break to work on adding these to my, my blanket. Um, this is from my wizard socks. Um, this is actually not a sock weight scrap at all. It's a sport weight scrap. It's from my um, whispering pine shawl. Uh, so it's Swan's Island Merino, organic Merino sport weight in the lavender colorway. But it crocheted up to pretty much exactly the same size as my fingering weight squares. So that's cool. I think there's a couple of other sport weight scraps in um, my blanket already. This is from a swap. Um, so I don't know, and I thought I'd, I'd crocheted all the yarns from um, previous swaps, but I realized when I was packing that I had not used this one yet. And it's really pretty, it's sort of pastel colors. Um, I think it might be a cotton or a cotton blend, um, but I'm not, I'm not certain. Um, it does not feel like 100% wool to me, and it does not look like 100% wool. Um, I don't, it's not, I don't think it's 100% cotton either. But I don't know what it is. This is from my Raina shawl. This one is from, hey, look, this shawl, Red Robin. And then these four are from um, the Space Cadet Mini Skein Club that um, Jeanette of Bookish Stitcher very kindly sent to me. So this one is just sort of purple. This one, this one reminds me of kind of a peach. Um, it's yellow and orange. Um, that one's, this one's really pretty. That's the first one I crocheted up. Um, and then these two are both sparkly. This one is browns and greens with kind of some hints of blue and purple. And this one I think is actually my favorite of the four and I thought that it was going to be my least favorite of the four. Um, it's reds. I mean I love them all but out of the four I thought that the yellow one was going to be my favorite and this one was going to be my least favorite. Um, but it's reds and oranges but then also blue and purple and kind of green and brown all in the same, and I love how it crocheted up. So I'm really, really pleased with that. So that is, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine new squares to add. So by the time I've added these, my blanket will be eight by eight and starting to turn into a nine by nine square. So that's exciting. 
that is, that's it. That's all of the knitting and crocheting that I have. Um, I've started a new spinning project. So this is the braid. Yay, it's so pretty. I love the bright orange right there. But it's primarily um, sort of purples and in different shades and a little bit of gray and sort of natural white. So this is what I have left, which is most of it. I only started this a few nights ago. Um, and let's see here, this is, it's a braid from Yarn Rescue, which I think this is adorable, look at that, um, which their website is yarnrescue.com and Linnell Coser is the dyer behind Yarn Rescue. Um, the little speech bubble says, step away from the acrylic. <laughs> That's so cute. Um, so this is a 4.2 ounce braid of Polworth in the eggplant colorway. Um, I actually got this a while ago, like before I was spinning. I don't know what possessed me to do that. But now I can spin, and so here we are, spinning. And I'm spinning this on my drop spindle, which is my only option for spinning. Um, and I have not done, this is a couple of, couple of hours worth of work. It's not, not a whole lot yet. Um, but I'm really pleased with how it, how it looks. And I'm not doing anything to, um, I feel like I need to learn how best to manage color in spinning because I have no idea what this is going to look like once I've spun it and applied it and I don't know how I'm going to apply it yet. Um, I think there's a craftsy class that's about color um, and different ways to spin different different sorts of color techniques. So I might need to look into that because um, I'm not sure if my spinning will do this justice. So that's that's my new spinning project because this is exciting. Hang on, let me just take a sip of tea. I finished my other spinning project. I have a skein of hand spun yarn, you guys. Spun by me. And I am so thrilled with this. Um, it is far from perfect, but, and it's, it's a two ply. Um, as you can tell, there's definitely parts that are more even than others. Um, we have, we have parts like this, which are, you know, kind of more of a worsted weight. And then we have parts like this, which are of fingering weight. <laughs> um, and I've, gosh, I weighed it and I know roughly how long it is. I don't own a nitty knotty. So I just wound it on my Swift um, before I, I gave it a nice little bath. And then, um, so I know roughly how much yarn I have, and I forgot to bring that over with me. Um, it's a fairly decent amount, like uh, certainly enough to make a hat, um, which I think is what I'm going to do with it. I know some people save their first skeins of hand spun, but I just want to use my first skein of hand spun. So there it is in all of its lovely glory. This is um, cephalopod yarns, um, their fiber in the Ursula colorway, so it's sort of pinks and blues and purples. Um, gosh, it does not make the tidiest little skein there, but anyways, um, yeah, I'm so, I'm so pleased with this. I'm just so proud to have a skein of yarn um, and I think I'm, I'm going to knit it into a hat of some sort. Um, might try a bank head, but I think maybe I'd do better to just do, um, a basic sort of ribbing and stockinette. Um, just because the yarn is thick and thin. Um, it's actually more regular than I thought it might be, but, um, it's definitely not by any means completely regular, which it's a hand spun. It doesn't need to be, so... Yes, so that is my first ever hand spun yarn. I'm so pleased. I'm so happy with it. So that's that. Um, I have no acquisitions this week. I've been too busy packing and finishing up at my job and um, stuff like that. I, I have not bought any yarn or fiber or 
much of anything, actually. <laughs> Not even food. <laughs> My kitchen is so bare and empty and sad. So let me talk to you about books. Um, I had to return all my library books to the library the other day, which was sad. Goodbye, DC Public Library. You did lots of good things for me. I'm going to miss you. Um, so I have, I have two books that I'm currently reading, and I actually didn't finish um, John the Pupil, which I mentioned last time I'd started. I'd read about 20 pages. Um, and I don't know why I didn't finish it. Um, I wanted to, and I enjoyed it when I was reading it, but it ended up not being something that I wanted to sit down and read. So I, I didn't, and then I had to return it. So I probably would have finished it if I'd not had the time crunch of knowing that I had to return all of my library books. Um, but oh well. So these are both um, books that I own. And the first one that I'm reading is Snow by Orhan Pamuk, who, if you're not familiar with him, he's a very well-known Turkish author. And this was translated from the Turkish by do, 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 Maureen Freely. Um, and it was a New York Times best book of the year, I think in 2013. Um, this book is, or two, maybe even, no, goodness, 2004. Um, older than I thought. <laughs> um, but anyways... I have not read a whole bunch of this, um, about 60 pages in or so, um, but so far very much enjoying it. It's a very distinct style of writing, and I think part of that probably has to do with the fact that he is a Turkish author, and it was translated from the Turkish. Um, I do not read a word of Turkish, so I couldn't compare it to the original language, but it's about this poet named Ka. Um, he has his name, his initials are K-A, and that's what he goes by, Ka, everybody, that's what everybody knows him as. Um, he's been in exile in Germany, and after 12 years, he returns to Turkey for his mother's funeral, and he goes to the city of Kars. Um, I don't know anything about Turkish geography, so I don't know where that is. But anyways, he takes a bus, two buses, from Istanbul to, which is where he grew up, and where his, his mother lived until she died. Um, so he goes, he takes two buses to cars, and on his way it starts snowing, and it's like heavy snow, and then they stop, you know, once, once he gets to cars, they stop bus travel because it's just too dangerous, too snowy. And so he's kind of stuck there. Um, he planned to stay for a little while. Um, he's pretending to be or he is planning to, I'm not sure, um, to write a report. There's been a wave of suicides among girls who have been forbidden to wear their headscarves to school. And he's also there because this woman that he loved, um, Ipek, and I'm, I don't know Turkish, so I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Um, she's recently been divorced, and so he kind of meets up with her there. Um, and realizes that he's in love with her, and, um, yeah. So that's about all I know so far, um, but I'm, I'm really enjoying it. It's a very, so the blurb here is from Margaret Atwood in the New York Times book review, and Atwood, obviously, as, as everybody knows, is an author that I really like, um, and she says, not only an engrossing feat of tail spinning, but essential reading for our times. Pamuk is narrating his country into being. What a lot of pressure to have to narrate your, your whole country. Can you imagine? That just, it strikes me as a very odd thing to say and kind of an uncomfortable thing to say that, um, Orhan Pamuk is kind of the voice of Turkish novelists that he's the only Turkish novelist that I know. Um, and I'm going to guess that a lot of other people know. Um, I'm, I'm thinking now, now that I've said that, and I'm not sure I might know other Turkish novelists, but his is the name that people recognize and certainly in the United States. Um, I just think that's very strange that, um, 
that that is the blurb that they chose to put on the cover. That's so much pressure to put on a single novelist and their work. But anyways, I'm it's a really very enjoyable read so far. But I don't know that it is um, driving reading. Um, I'm very lucky. I can read in the car um, without getting car sick. So, but you know, you need kind of a specific. It needs to be something that you something relatively light to read um, while you're in the car. So yesterday, I went to a very venerable DC bookstore, uh, Kramer Books and Afterwards. Um, it's a, a bookstore and a cafe. Um, and it's afterwards. Kramer Books is the bookstore and afterwards is the cafe. Um, and they're very, very well known. If you live in DC, you know them. Um, I, I think they and politics and prose are probably... The, the two sort of big independent bookstores in DC. Um, there's Best Boys and Poets too, but um, I think Politics and Prose and Kramer Books are really the, the big ones. And I went in, I was meeting somebody for lunch in that area and I was early. So I stopped in Kramer Books thinking I need to get something to read for the drive. And if I see something good, I'll get it, but I'm not going to stress myself out over finding the perfect book. For the drive. Um, and I feel like, let's see here, somebody introduced themselves in my Ravelry group, and I don't remember who it was, and I'm so sorry. Um, I meant to look it up before I podcasted, and I forgot. Um, but they mentioned that they were reading The Gollum and the Ginny by Helen Wecker. Uh, sorry, Helene Wecker. Um, and I think Jeanette of Bookish Stitcher might have read The Gollum and the Ginny as well. And it's kind of been on my to-read list since people mentioned it to me. And I picked up and put down a bunch of other books. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, I picked up and put down Wolf Hall, um, mostly because I, I, I want to read Wolf Hall. I have not. Um, but for those of you who aren't familiar, it's about, I believe, Thomas Cromwell. Um, during the time of, it's from his perspective during Henry VIII's reign. Um, and it's kind of swept the literary world and it's been made into a TV show and all of that good stuff. But I was slightly frustrated because the blurb on the cover talked about how it was like um, a couple of actual historical fiction books and then also, you know, Game of Thrones. And I was just a little bit annoyed because <laughs> Game of Thrones is a fantasy novel, not actually Western Europe historical fiction based on, but not actually. Um, I read the first Game of Thrones book. I have not seen the TV series. Um, I'm just, it didn't grab me. I know I'm in a minority there, but that's okay. That's okay. So I picked up and put down Wolf Hall. Um, I picked up and put down a few other things that um, lots of people have been reading and talking about lately. And then I saw this. And I was like, that yes, this is exactly what I want to read right now. So it's set in New York City in 1899. Um, so sort of fin de siècle, um, New York City. And, oh gosh, I bought this book yesterday. And I read over 100 pages yesterday. And I have not read any today because <laughs> I'm conscious that I have to save this for the drive. Um, it's about a 12-hour drive, for those of you who are not familiar, and we're doing it all in one day. Um, so, Gollum is a Jewish folklore figure, I guess. Um, they're made from clay, and they are sort of very protective um, creatures. And then jinns are... Um, Arabic folkloric figures. And Gollum, whose name is Chava, and or she's named Chava. And the Jinn, whose name is Ahmad, end up in New York City and find themselves alone in lower Manhattan and trying to fit in 
and they have not even met each other yet. Um, but this book is just peopled by the most incredible cast of supporting characters. Um, immigrants to New York City, and um, Ahmad has just met a very wealthy woman who lives on the, you know, right near Central Park in Manhattan, um, on the Upper West Side, Upper East Side. Um, it's just the most vibrant set of supporting characters, and I love it. Um, yeah, I highly, highly recommend this. It kind of beautifully blends historical fiction and sort of a fantasy um, aspect. I guess urban fantasy maybe might be the right word, but I'm not, I don't know. I'm not sure what, what exactly it is, but Helene Wecker has just an incredible storytelling gift, and I'm so excited to make a, an, a dent in this. Um, and it's, I just, I love the color cover, and I love whatever font they used here. I think it's really pretty. Um, this arch, I do believe, is in Washington Square Park. Um, yep. Because the, the Ginny lives in, in Little Syria, which was right near um, Washington Square Park. So, yes, highly recommend this. And I spent most of yesterday afternoon reading it in... Um, and if you follow me on Instagram, you'll have seen my, my photos from uh, the Bishop's Garden at Washington National Cathedral, which is an Anglican church, uh, Episcopalian church. Um, and the Bishop's Garden is one of my favorite spots in the entire District of Columbia. Um, it's always, there's always people there, but it's quiet. Um, there's never so many people there that it's, it's overwhelming, but there's enough people there that you feel like there's, you know, some sort of community going on. And part of the garden is based on monastic gardens from the ninth century. And so they have all sorts of useful herbs and they kind of pulled the, the plants that are planted there come from, um, Abbot, oh gosh, what's his last name? Oh, it's a poem called Horchilis, which means little garden, by Abbot, Abbot I want to say Abbot Strabo, but I don't think that's right, because Strabo was a geographer. I will post about it in my show notes. Um, poem by an abbot, um, but they also pull on the, from the um, garden plans in the Sangal plan, which if you're, that's another thing, if you're not familiar with the, the Sangal plan, um, the monastery that was built based on the plan no longer exists. It was destroyed. Um, but the plan survives intact, and it's this incredible resource for monastic life in the early Middle Ages. Um, and the whole thing is digitized and online, so I will certainly post a link to that as well. Um, and then they have other parts of the garden that are based on um, various other, there's, there's a rose garden and then there's kind of a sort of green grassy open area. Um, it's not a very big garden, but they have, there's a lot of stuff going on and there's plenty of benches. So I found a nice bench in the shade that was sort of getting a nice breeze and sat there and read for several hours yesterday afternoon, which was really a really delightful way to spend. I, th I thought about going to a museum and I decided that I just wanted to kind of sit and soak up my last few days in the area. Um, but because this is not stitching between pages without at least a mention of a museum, um, earlier this week I went to the Postal Museum, which is, uh, it's a Smithsonian Museum, but it is not on the mall. It's right by Union Station, which is the train station, um, basically across the street from Union Station. And I'd been, when I was a kid, when we visited DC as a family, but I've not been since then. And it's a super cool museum. Um, they go through the whole history of the postal service and sort of, you know, how letters have been moved and different postal technologies. Um, they have some mail planes. I love mail planes. Apparently that's a thing now. Um, I really like sort of 1930s mail planes. Um, different mail trucks and how that technology has changed. They have a, a model of a stagecoach. Uh, they talk about the Pony Express and um, 
they also have their stamp collection, which has some real gems of famous stamps. Um, I'm not, oh gosh, I should have, I thought, I thought last night, I need to look up what this stamp is called before I podcast. And I totally forgot, uh, but it's one of the most famous stamp printing errors in possibly ever. Um, it was a 1930s stamp, 19 teens, early 20th century stamp. We're going to go with that. Um, that had a plane on it. And there was one sheet printed where the plane is upside down. Or one sheet that was sold with the plane upside down. Um, so 100 stamps, I think. And the Postal Museum has a block of four stamps um, of this upside down. The inverted Jenny, that might be what it's called. Uh, again, it will be in my show notes. Sorry about that. Um, but it's a neat story. This one guy went to the post office and and it was a post office in D.C. where this single sheet was sold. And um, he bought it and he kept it and he hid it because postal authorities were like, we can't have this floating around. And then he sold it and the stamps sell for thousands of dollars, possibly millions of dollars now. Um, but he knew immediately that it was it was worth hanging on to this, this sheet of stamps. Um, so they those and they also have... Um, letters that were on the Titanic, they have letters that were on the Hindenburg, they have um, all different other, there's actually the oldest thing in their collection is a 1390 letter. So there was my nice little dose of medieval history at the Postal Museum. Um, it was a letter, I think that was sent in Venice or sent to Venice um, about the Silk Road um, trade route. Um, Silk Road was not a single road, it was a series of, of trade routes. Um, very fascinating if you're ever, I guess that's more Central Asia, Central Asian history, but it obviously had a very strong impact on European history. Um, because when we think of, of medieval material culture, we think a lot about um, religious material culture, so things like icons and reliquaries and um, paintings of the Virgin Mary and other sort of religious paintings. Um, but actually what medieval Europeans themselves valued most were fabulous textiles. And so you can see a lot of that in their art. Um, and it's really fun to go and look at medieval art and look at um, the fabulous textiles that are that are painted, that are recorded in the paintings. Um, so obviously the Silk Road had a, had a tremendous impact on, on hit world history, really. Um, certainly not just European and not, certainly not just Central Asian. Um, so yeah, that was that was another cool thing that was at the Postal Museum. Um, it's just a, it's a really fun place to spend a couple of hours. Um, it's not a very big museum, but it's um, it's a neat one. And it's I think is it the most recent Smithsonian Museum? I think they opened in like 1993. I think so. Um, so yeah, I think that is all I have. Um, I'm sorry if this episode seemed a little disjointed. I'm feeling a little bit disjointed. <laughs> All of this packing, I keep looking at these boxes and they're calling me. They're like, why are you not packing right now? You should be packing this moment. You need to finish packing, Robin. And I do. I need to finish packing. Um, so I think, I think that's all I have. Um, thank you so much for watching, everybody. Um, I, you know, get in touch with me. Can't promise that I will respond quickly because of moving reasons, but I certainly will respond. Um, and you know, thank you to everybody who's been in touch over the past couple of weeks. And um, hopefully, this will go up on Sunday. And hopefully, um, there will be another episode in two weeks. Um, I'm hoping to make a major dent in the the projects that I have packed in my in my coffee bag. Um, so hopefully I will, I will have some things to show you in two weeks. And yeah, so very exciting things, um, non-knitting related. But I'm, I'm hoping that my podcast, my little Stitching Between Pages adventure can continue. Um, so thank you all for joining, joining me and then sitting down and having a little knit and... Um, it's always fun. I love, oh gosh, my stomach just rumbled. I hope you didn't hear that. I obviously need to have some lunch before I pack anymore. 
Um, I don't know what I'm going to have for lunch because I have like next to no food. <laughs> Ooh, I have a tomato and I have some cheese. So I think I'll have a tomato and cheese sandwich. Yes. Yes. So I am going to let you all go um, and I will hopefully see you in two weeks. Have a good one. Uh, thanks again for watching and see you next time. Bye.